Dr. Alicia Grinnell is an educational improvement expert specializing in how to apply the science of improvement to help teams, organizations, and networks reach their improvement goals. Alicia started her career as a bilingual teacher in Denver Public Schools and then in New York City, always working to improve outcomes for students who speak a language other than English. Alicia is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Foundation and co-founded the Improvement Collective, a partnership dedicated to helping organizations to build their improvement capacity in order to solve important problems in education and also the broader social factor sector. Um, welcome, Alicia. And I also want to introduce you to our incredible panelists. As you can see here from Decatur, we have Dr. Christy Bean and Dr. Gail Hardwick. From Austin, we have Emily Macias Capellan and Jessica Turner. From Port Chester, we have Dr. Colleen Carroll, Colleen Carroll and Judy Diaz. And from Fremont County in Shoshone, we have Andrea Gilbertson, Heidi Christensen, and Afton Kisling. Welcome, we're so excited. And before I pass it on to Alicia that is going to set the tone for us, I wanna tell you a little bit about these four incredible districts. So some of them are just starting with us. Some of them have been with us for as long as five years. So different grade levels, different languages. So they have so much to share. If you have questions, please continue to post them in the chat. So without further ado, Alicia, welcome and kick us off. Thanks, Amelia. It's fantastic to be here with you all today, talking about um, some of my favorite topics, the, how, to, how to improve generally and literacy very specifically. So. It uh, should be exciting, exciting time. Um, I'll just give you, I thought I'd start just by giving y'all a sense of, you know, how I got here and how I got to uh, be presenting on this webinar. So as Amelia mentioned, I started as a bilingual teacher in Denver, New York City. Um, here's some of my kiddos from New York City. I taught first and second grade. Um, you know, when I was a teacher, I think one of the things I didn't know that I was going to be fascinated by, but I was very early fascinated by was this process of watching kids learn how to read. I still to this day think it's like one of the most magical, fun, amazing, amazing things to be able to do as a teacher. And when I was working in the education system, you know, I went from trying to understand, well, how do you help a single kid learn how to read to how do you get a whole classroom of kids to learn how to read to how do you get a whole school full of kids to learn how to read, right? So sort of thinking about those pieces. I will confess that as a teacher, I was really, I was gonna get all of my kids on grade level readings, pass them on to second grade on uh, grade level and never once quite got there um, as a teacher. And so I think there was, there's some interesting insights there about how hard it is um, really to do that um, as you go forward. So if you fast forward a little bit in my career, I came across this thing called improvement science. It also goes by names like quality improvement. Probably we all call it continuous improvement. It probably has other names. Um, and it kind of blew my mind. So in my case, I had this opportunity to learn improvement science in healthcare because in education, we weren't using it yet. It wasn't something that had entered into our field. Um, but it turns out that there are these ways of going about improving that other organizations um, have invested in. And so organizations that are good at improving, they, they do certain things and, and you can learn about those things. And I was immediately fascinated um, by that um, and sort of did, did a little bit of a turn of spending more and more of my time thinking about the improvement side of things. And so today I have the, what I think of is one of the coolest jobs ever is I get to work on people that are work with people all across the country that are working on improving different aspects um, of education, whether it be some are working on early childhood, some are working on college access. Um, and so here's a, a recent picture I'm from, I saw somebody from SFUSD, I'm, I'm in the Bay Area. This is a recent cohort of people from all over the country working on learning how to coach improvement. Um, I think if, you know, if I was, I don't know, born maybe 10 years later, or my career had switched, what I would be doing is what the rest of the people on the panel are doing is I would love to be like in the mix of trying to figure out how do you improve complex systems. So I'm really excited to get to that part of the conversations where we get to 
dig in the nitty gritty of, of what that actually looks like um, going forward. So if we're gonna talk about improvements, I'm gonna just do some some setting the stage of you know the science of improvement. What is this, this idea of improvement? Anytime we talk about improvement, you have to be starting from this place where you're recognizing, recognizing that there is some gap between the vision, what we're trying to do, what brought us here, what our organizations are set up to do, and what we're currently able to do, right? And so that part of it is holding that creative tension, that knowledge that there is a gap here that we could do better and trying to figure out how it is that you would get there. Well, the science of improvement is quite simply a study and a collection of ideas around organizations that are really good at doing that, that over and over again can go from setting visions to getting to those visions. Um, it tries to codify what those practices are and what it is that they do. And in short, so there's a whole, you, you know, we could talk about this for a long period of time, as you can imagine, since it's called improvement science. But at the base of what they're doing is they're doubling down on the idea that what we need to do is learn our way into improvement, right? So that if there is a gap between the current reality and vision, it's because we don't know how to close that gap. And so what we need to do is double down on that learning process. So this is a little bit different than how we've sometimes tried to, to change things in the past, right? So it's not about a shiny new program. It's not about incentivizing people or training people, but it's about like, how do we actually work together um, towards these outcomes that we seek? Um, and so that's the really the big idea that, that falls behind improvement science. You know, and when I first encountered it, I think the thing that I found really uh, inspiring was this idea that you could get better at getting better, right? That improvement was a skill that an organization could invest in, right? So we, when I was in the, in the classroom, we talked a lot about what you needed to do to improve, right? Like what are the pieces? Um, but then, you know, we can know a lot about what it is required to improve and that's a whole different ball game than knowing how to get it to happen um, in, in the places that we were. I, I do remember being like 22 or 23 and, I would go to these professional development, largely around English learners, and I would learn something that we were supposed to be doing in you know, English learner literacy. And I would be like, oh, well, we're not doing that in our school. So I'll just come back to the teachers and I'll tell them that's what we should be doing. And I remember naively thinking that all I needed to do is come back and tell them and then we were, it was gonna magically happen, which of course now we know that's much more complex than that. But that's, I think the spirit between the idea of knowing what and knowing how are two different things. And where the real hope comes here is um, is an intersection of these pieces. It's figuring out how do we know about, about literacy? What do we know about literacy and how do we pair that with how we know how to improve complex um, organizations as we go forward? Now, if you have anybody that's gonna come on any sort of webinar and is gonna talk to you about improvement, the first thing you should ask them is like, well, you, you know, well, where's the data that you have, right? So you can't, you can't peddle an improvement if you don't talk anything about data. So I'm just gonna share a couple of projects really quickly that I found really inspiring. Because you might ask me like, how are you, are you sure that improvement science is definitely the best way to improve anything? And the answer is like, no, I don't know if that's the best way to improve anything. But I will say what gives me optimism is I've seen across multiple sectors and in multiple problems that it that helps do what I care about, which is transfer outcome, transform outcomes for kids. So one of the early projects I learned about was this um, successful effort in Ghana that reduced the under five mortality. Um, rate right across 134 hospitals in Ghana. So super impactful outcome and large scale change um, and using that kind of approach. Uh, there's a group, a district in Menominee Falls, which is in Wisconsin, who used improvement to figure out how to reduce suspensions for students with disabilities across the entire district. And you see, can see how it went from 58% down to 25%, which is um, an amazing growth. And one of the, the first projects that I got to work on was around uh, developmental math or remedial math in community colleges. Um, and through using these sort of improvement science methodologies through getting a network together to learn together, we were able to triple the success rate of students getting through that uh, developmental math um, in, in, in much shorter period of time, which was very consequential, right? And so this is what we're after, right, y'all? We're after like not only some good ideas about how to do things, we're after Outcome is that when we show a graph, we could picture the kids, we could picture the lives that, that we've really improved um, through these, these different pieces, which is really important. So back in, oh, I don't remember what year it was now, but a, a number of years ago, um, after cruising around how do organizations improve, uh, we wrote a book trying to codify what is improvement science? Like, how can you like boil it down? And, and what does it mean to, to take this science and education 
is a book called Learning to Improve. And, and we boiled it down into six principles. And don't you worry, I'm not going to talk about all six principles today. We, we, could, we could get into it. But I, I picked two that sort of spoke to me at this particular moment in time. And I thought I'd just um, talk a little bit about those pieces and, and the insights of it. And if you're interested more um, in the nerdy part of the improvement piece, then, then we can do that another time. So I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about systems. And I'm going to talk a little bit about learning. So I thought that's where we would uh, kind of start today. So when you take an improvement science approach, one of the important principles, that we, we sometimes call this the first, the first, um, the central law of improvement, is we come from a place where we believe that every system is perfectly designed to get exactly the results that it gets. I might venture this, and maybe some of you have heard this adage before, no? So this is something that I come back to all the time. I probably think it in my head. Um, over and over again is that every system is perfectly designed to get exactly the results it gets. So if you get 35% kids learning how to read by 30 grade, 30, third grade, we have a system that is perfectly designed to get 35% of kids to read by the end of third grade. If we have a system that by fifth grade, some kids love reading, some kids hate reading, or certain groups of kids are doing well and certain other groups of kids are doing well, we have a system that is perfectly designed to get exactly those results that it gets. And so the big so what we do with improvement is we work on improving the system to produce the results that we want, right? So if you want different results, we need a different system. The thing I think is, is interesting about that is if you, it's is in contrast to if you sort of think through conversations we have about what needs to change. So we're much more used to blaming people or individuals, right? They're either good teachers or bad teachers or good leaders or bad leaders. But the, the premise here is that you could take the same you could take different people. You could swap out the people you have in your system for different people, and you would get the same result because the system is trumping the individual efforts of the people that work in your system. I will say, as a teacher who really tried hard to be the like hero teacher that was going to push out that system and change it, you know, I think I made some improvements by banding arms with my colleagues when I worked in New York City. But I tell you, I I left, and it went right back. To the way that it was, right? So individuals can push systems for a while, but if we want real change, we really gotta we gotta shift the overall system. And so the second thing that comes out of this, which is gonna come surprising to nobody in the panelists, is the systems we're trying to change are very complex. And so to illustrate this, I'm gonna use a very oversimplified example just to sort of illustrate the logic. So let's say that what we want, one of the things we're working on, by the way, we're working on a lot of other things at the same time, but one of the things we want to work on is all kids are thriving readers, right? All of them thriving, loving, reading to do the things they wanna do. So you just start to think through all the things that need to happen in order for that to be true, right? Across all kinds of different classrooms, all kinds of different kids and all kinds of different schools. So there's a bunch of stuff that needs to happen in the classroom. I just listed some things here, way fewer than is probably true, right? Kids need to be able to read books that they love. They need to conference with the teacher. They need small group instruction. You guys know much more on the literacy side than I do on this piece, but you, you can imagine that there's things that need to happen in every single classroom. I know when I was a teacher, I think I understood what needed to happen more or less in the classroom. But even when you get to that place, classrooms are complex systems, any of us that have worked in a classroom. Getting things, these things to happen day in, day out on a regular basis is really, really hard even if you know what should happen, right? For a whole host of different reasons. For the things that happen in the classroom at the home that we need, it's gonna be dependent on what teachers are able to do outside of the classroom, right? I listed a couple here in yellow. For those things that happen, is gonna depend on a whole bunch of support systems that are supposed to support the system that's happening in the classroom, including tier two instruction, including opportunities to get coaching and teaching, Sometimes these are even coming not from inside the school, but coming from external folks like the American Reading Company, right? So you've got a whole host of other things. Then in order for those things to happen, things at the school have to happen, right? Because if you can't get those things to happen, they don't happen. And of course, there's stuff at the district that is enabling or getting in the way of things that happened before. And so the this is way over way under, way oversimplified and still at the same time, fairly overwhelming to think about what it really takes by so many different people in so many different parts of the system for us to get it to a place where we can say, it doesn't matter what, what classroom or it doesn't matter what school your kid goes to, your kid is gonna for sure learn how to read and thrive as a reader, right? It's a very complex piece. And, and for me, the thing I think that's really important is that there's people doing all of these things. 
And these people are working hard and they're doing their best and they have good intentions. And that's the place we're going to come from. And still, that's not going to be enough. The work is to get everything to be aligned, to add up so that it really adds up to support all kids to learn how to read. And that's hard work. It's not about getting the parts right. It's not about how getting um, individual pieces of it right. But it's how do we get all of these pieces to come together in the service of kids. And that's really the work um, of really of, of systems. What a, one uh, a systems expert that you may have heard of, his name is Peter Sande. He has a, a lot of really insightful writing about systems, but this is one I think is really important. And I think also is gonna to speak to some things that we're gonna hear about for a moment. The transforming systems is really about transforming a relationship between the people who make up the system. Hmm. Because that is what we're gonna to need to do if we're gonna to get to this place where we're, where um, where we can get all kids to learn how to read. So so that's one thought, right? Is that we're, we to really kind of lean into this idea of systems change, that they're complex systems, and then what the implication is of that systems change, of what it's going to look like as we go forward. A second piece is to talk about learning, and in this in in the book we call this learn through disciplined inquiry. Now, I told you before, one of the things that really distinguishes improvement science is that it assumes that you close gaps by learning. So it assumes that if you have gaps, it's because we don't know how to close the gaps. And so we need to learn. Well, it turns out that we don't just naturally learn by having experiences in life. You actually have to put some discipline into it or you'd actually codify and pull out the learnings um, as they come up in everyday practice. So one of my favorite uh, improvement methodologies to use is something that's what I find eloquently simple and can be used to improve a whole host of things. We call it the model for improvement. And it simply is three questions um, and combined with a mini experiment. So the first question is getting clear on what specifically are we trying to accomplish? So if we're all gonna work together, we all need to say, hey, when we're saying what direction we're heading, we all need to be pointing in the same direction, right? We need to say, oh, we are trying to accomplish that. This is the direction we're headed together. How will we know that a change is an improvement? We got probably lots of ideas, y'all. Lots of ideas about changes and some of them are improvements or some are not. So it's good to say up front, like, how are we gonna know a change is an improvement? And then what changes might we introduce and why? So those three questions become these questions that you continually ask groups as we try to think and you ask each other as you're trying to think of, of how do we do better by kids? And then you pair it with running experiments because all kinds of ideas sound really good in our heads. And when they pop to my mind, I know mine all sound brilliant, but then like running practice complex systems, you don't know how they're gonna react. So we need to try them out and practice and see which ones work and discard the ones that don't work for us and, and scale up the ones that really do, right? So I thought I'd just share a couple of very quick examples of ways that the discipline is helpful. So I told you I worked for a while on really changing remedial math education in community colleges. And one of the things I remember that there was a big group, we were going around and we were looking at math instruction in community colleges and it seemed very clear that the instruction needed to shift. It was real rote instruction to be short and it needed to be much more problem math, math sense making kinds of instruction. And so we were like ready and rearing to go on like, we're gonna shift to problem-based instruction where, where students were working with real problems. But then if you like zoom up a couple of questions and we ask ourselves, okay, well, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? And how do we know the changes and improvement? What we were really wanting to do, the big barrier was that students weren't completing their math requirement and therefore they weren't graduating. And by even just articulating that, it emerged this, what the thinking shifted because what you learned and what we went and looked at and then learned is you weren't actually losing all of the students in the class. It's not that they were taking the class and failing it, you were losing them between math classes. Right, so if this is what we were trying to accomplish and apply different changes that we needed in order to see um, if they were an improvement. Don't worry, we also worked on the instruction, but there was like things that were missing uh, in terms of to get us where our goal is, but we needed to be able to articulate and say out loud what that goal was. A very different example, I worked with a group in New Zealand actually that were working on increasing attendance at, at, in ACE programs. They were actually interested in oral language, but they were working on this first. So they were looking at attendance rates and it seemed very clear to the team that was working on this that the change idea needed to be to provide transportation, right? Kids aren't coming to school must be because they don't have any transportation. And their improvement coach said, hey, you know, that seems like a good idea, but can we test that? Can we test that just for one week? So they just borrowed a van. They just borrowed a van from somebody and they tried testing it. Turned out the kids were not not coming to school because they didn't have transportation. The mm -hmm. kids were not, not coming to school because they were supposed to bring a lunch. And they learned this through this small scale test, 
that was the, the actual barrier was something different for the kids that they tested it with. And so this allowed them to move relatively quickly onto a more productive idea for change, right? Instead of rolling out a big transportation system in your district and then and then later learning that that wasn't what was going to work. So, you know, the the this idea, part of the reason I love the idea of having the model from permit, which is really simple, it's three questions, and then this proclivity to experiment with things before we like go all in on them is because it allows everybody to learn in the org. So if you think about that, that map we have before, anybody can use it to improve what they did. And there was this, this really, I find very optimistic story from Menominee Falls, which is that district I talked about earlier, where the janitors um, figured out how to reduce costs in their work in, a, in an elementary school because the elementary school was about to cut two teachers, a kindergarten teacher and a first grade teacher. And they were like, oh, we think we can use improvement to reduce our costs so that the kids, so we don't have to lose two teachers, right? And so the beauty of democratizing the learning so that anybody can contribute and those ideas can, can pop up, I think is um, really important. And this is what you see in improvement organizations. So across sectors, organizations are really good at improving, are good at taking advantage of the learning potential of all of the people in their organization. And for me, I find that very ironic because we are the learning sector. I feel like we should be really good at learning, but I think we're much better at thinking about kids learning than how our organizations or, or our adults are able to learn as we go forward. So I'll, I'll take you a quote here from Brian Stevenson. Um, and he talks about the, about proximity, right? And so he says, you cannot be an effective problem solver from a distance. There are details and nuances to problems that you will miss unless you are close enough to observe those details. And I would harbor a guess that the people that are the most underutilized in our educational improvement efforts are the people that are closest, that are the closest to the kids. So we tend to, to do top-down efforts where we don't like unleash that learning potential as they go forward. Um, but something that can be really important as we go forward. So here's here's where we'll end with these two pieces. I think that these two are really related, right? So this idea of if we believe the systems produce problems, and if we believe that our systems are really complex, the typical top-down strategies where we where a few people at the top tell other people what to do and other people are supposed to just follow those rules, it's not going to work, right? There's just too many different pieces that no no small group of people could possibly figure out and they're too far away right from the actual problems to improve it but instead if we could all be engaged in this collective learning where everybody's improving their part of the system and very importantly the interconnections between all of our parts of the system i think that's where a lot of the hope for improved systems on a whole range of problems and in literacy really lies and so with that Let's hear from some people who are deeply in the improvement work and what they've found from a real practical standpoint. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, you gave us a lot to think about, but I really want to start like now hearing about this journey for different places, right? So um, based on this gap between what you want and what you have, right, your vision of like literacy and your current reality, I would like to ask each district, one member of each district, to kind of reflect on what brought you to work. What was the gap between the vision and your current reality? And I'm going to start with, um, let's start with Austin. Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jessica Turner from Austin. Our vision, our vision is directly aligned with ARC, which I think is a beautiful thing. And literacy is a barrier for some kids. And the work that we do is to remove barriers and dissolve systems that create those barriers. So in our vision, we want all students to be rich readers and writers and to just have rich literacy lives. And that's where we want to go. We're not there yet. We just started this year and the current practices we had in previous time, it was it was a lot of work, but it wasn't getting the results that we want. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. You just started. Let's go ahead and go to Shoshone. You have been with us for over five years. So talk us, talk to us about your uh, vision and your reality. What was that gap? You bet. So hello, everybody. This is Andrea Gilbertson. I'm the elementary principal here at Shoshone. Um, you know, our vision for literacy really is for students not only to be functional um, readers, but especially to truly have a love of reading that will serve them throughout their lifetime. 
Um, we've worked so, so hard um, on building this culture of reading. You know, prior we had a situation where, frankly, kids did not love to read. Um, it was a struggle. Uh, reading class, just general struggles across the board. Um, and so really we've worked, again, just had this collective commitment um, to, to move from a place where students didn't love reading to where now we can say that we really have our current reality of a place where kids love to read. You'll see it in our school um, every single day. They are engaged. They talk about books with friends. They talk with teachers. They can talk about authors, They um, their favorite series. So um, our entire staff, our students, our community really do believe in the importance and the value of reading at this point. And we are so proud of that. Um, furthermore, we have been able to um, progress into our secondary school. So we had started out with ARC in our elementary school school again five years ago and um, now we actually have it through our through our junior high and high school um, with seeing tremendous growth and tremendous um, gains across the board. Um, I would say our gap again is um, you know looking at our our vision um, ultimately we want to continue to just really impact every individual child um, in their reading and also teachers and giving them the skills and the support um, to to reach every child and so we are we are working towards that every every day and um, our are really living our vision of literacy and we're really proud of that right now so thank you thank you Decatur let's talk about your gap your vision and your current reality yes hi I'm Christy Beam I'm the assistant superintendent for teaching and learning here in city schools of Decatur um you know here in Decatur we recognize and we value the extensive body of research known come to come to be known and loved as the science of reading um, we have very engaged parents who who push us to do our best and um, really stay in, in evidence based practices. We know from that research that students in kindergarten and first grade should be focused or emphasizing word recognition and decoding, and then that shifts as they become more proficient readers. But we also have to be building um, word recognition. I mean, while we're working on word recognition, we have to be building vocabulary and we have to have those rich, complex texts. So that's when all of this in mind, we adopted ARC two years ago, definitely met our um, you know, matched with our core values as well. And we've actually adopted the language of transformative literacy as our, as what we say that we teach here in um, Decatur. It's not balanced literacy, it's not um, certainly literacy, we teach transformative literacy. And so, um, you know, meaning that we take the science of reading, but we do that from an inquiry based uh, knowledge building. We we really want students engaging with that complex text, and the ultimate goal is that they're reading and writing um, using evidence. And so, to reach that vision, we're 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 doing well. Uh, but to move us from good to great, and I have to tell you, that's one of my that Deming quote is one of my favorite quotes. I use it all the time. Systems are set up to get the results that they're getting, and and I do believe that. And we have to change what we're doing. Um, in order to meet the needs of all students. And so where we are right now currently, we're a very high performing district, about 85 to 90% of our students are reading um, at grade level. However, we have a pervasive and persistent um, disproportionality between black and white students. And we also see um, a lack of growth with our students on both ends. So our low performing students and our gifted students are not showing the growth that we want them to see. So we're really, we also had, um, we've had a very, um, historically we have had a very school or classroom centered um, curriculum, meaning that everybody was doing what they thought was best. Of course, that wasn't good for our teachers because they were spending an enormous amount of time finding finding resources um, and the resources that they found, as I said, are getting the results that um, that that we got. So by providing our teachers with high quality um, professional learning and high quality, we know the effect size of high quality curriculum. We embarked three years ago on really deeply engaging and what, what is that going to look like? And so we did end up um, adopting ARC and we are super excited. We're, we're seeing growth, we're seeing alignment, we're seeing um, you know, we're, we we know that the using Erla the, with the small group instruction that we are going to see those changes and shifts in, in our classroom. So that's thank you. Do. Thank you. And we have one district left for Chester. Show us your gap. Hi. So 
uh, John F. Kennedy Elementary School in Port Chester. Um, we are a K-5 dual language school with uh, over 70% of students um, as English language learners and a high poverty rate. Uh, but regardless of our demographics and perceived challenges, um, our vision really here, at least at JFK, and I'm sure it's one that's shared amongst other buildings in the district, is really to create strong, well-rounded readers and writers. You know, equal access to high leverage instruction where students can develop necessary foundational skills, um, you know, learn long language and text structures, and ultimately learn content content and to be able to think critically in two languages, at least that for here, for uh, here at JFK, by literacy is important to us. Um, and, um, you know, we want to do all of this um, and also reduce the um, number of students who need intervention services because across the board in both languages as the years go by with all of the good efforts and the hard work that teachers are putting in every day to target our students in reading and writing, the gap just keeps widening and you know the amount and percentage of students who need intervention services, be it at a tier two or at a tier three, um, and then finding those resources to target those kids based on their um, areas of need into languages has been increasingly difficult because ultimately what we want to do is to increase student performance. Thank you so much. I hope you all heard that there was an effort to align um, uh, like people, resources with the goals, right? Everybody talked around this idea that everybody has to be on the same page. Now, when Alicia was talking about, she, she did say that this idea of bringing together the knowledge of the what with the knowledge of how to do it is a challenge and that is what you're trying to do. And she also talked about the use of data. So from a, a district perspective, Dr. Carroll, can you share with us a little bit, how are you pulling this off? Bringing the what, the how, the data, what's going on? Right, great. So thank you, um, I'm Colleen Carroll from Portchester School District Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction. So, um, ARC is a fabulous program we're finding because it brings that together for us in the past. And, um, and one of the things that we have felt was our gap in equity was a consistent approach. Um, as um, Mrs. Diaz, Judy explained how we have um, multiple buildings and we have lots of English language learners. What our teachers were doing was trying to find the best resources in our, and um, everyone was trying to find the best resources they thought were going to help our students. And we had a lot of inconsistent approaches, unfortunately. Um, so in doing our research and we came across ARC and we really did a lot of um, deep dive into the program, we loved the fact that it is the what and the how. Uh, there's a robust body of resources from classroom libraries and research to online uh, ARC bookshelf. And so the, the what is extensive. We're learning through doing, we're learning through um, students having access to science and social studies content, to fiction and nonfiction. The engagement text is uh, through the roof. So there's, there's a lot of um, opportunities for students to learn in multiple ways for reading and writing. Uh, but also we have ample professional development, which is one of the things that I think creates the success in any program is the support for the teachers and the, the explanation and handholding through something brand new, because this is a brand new program for us. And um, we're in year, year one rollout and it's a two year rollout for K-5, which is exciting, but we can't do it without that partnership. And we really do see ARC as a partnership uh, where our your trainers are coming to our buildings and really working hand in hand, not only with our teachers, but then we have training at the leadership level so that us as principals and directors and assistant superintendents, we're all in their weeds, rolling up our sleeves and getting into the how uh, so that we understand exactly what's going on and can support our teachers when the trainers aren't there. So, so the what and the how go hand in hand and they're not, they're not separated and we do have both. And then we're looking at the data in school pace, the exciting thing for us about the data and for the school pace uh, software program. And we're both giving the Erla and the Anil, which is the English and Spanish assessment, is that it's data all the time, consistently, ongoingly. We're not waiting anymore for four, six, eight, 12 weeks in between assessments to determine how our students are doing and what we should do about it. We get to see data in real time often and ongoingly and then pivot 
If it's not working, we know right away. We're running um, PDSAs, plan, do, study, acts consistently, looking at small problems and making changes and shifts and pivoting when we see something not working. We're no longer waiting weeks and weeks for to be able to do that. So that's super exciting. Thank you. I hope you are listening when uh, Dr. Bing and then when you were just sharing, there was this good intention going wrong, right? Everybody was doing the best they could do with a bunch of stuff, but there was no consistency. And both of you talked about the importance of consistency. So we, you increase the opportunities for all students. I wanted to hear from a, like a principal perspective, Judy, can you share with us a little bit, like from a principal, how are you ensuring the what and the how are coming together and how are you using data? So one of the first things I think that's really important for us to acknowledge, the building level at least, is to acknowledge that this is a very complex um that the work itself is very complex. It's multifaceted, it's so interconnected. Um, you know, I know some districts choose to um, in, um, embark in the core before the Earl and the Anil, and some will do the assessment before the cores. I kind of like that we're doing it all at once. It, I know it's hard. I know that um, it's, you know, there's a lot of learning for us. And sometimes it seems very overwhelming to the teachers who are doing it. But just because I feel like, you know, you, it's almost not impossible, but it's hard. I think it would be harder for us to really see the impact of the program if we were doing it in pieces. I'd like that we can see it all. We have the core instruction going on, the PD that's associated with it. We have the early and the anneal piece of it. We have the, the toolkit. Uh, training that go, comes hand in hand. And, you know, what does it mean to confer with a student? How do you input this evidence? Um, how do, how are you tracking your, your power goals? It's so complex. So off the bat, we say, we know this is hard work and thank you for the work that you're doing. But I think um, another thing that's important for us, um, at least at the building level, has been to work closely, not only with the um, ARC coaches who have been phenomenal, who work with the teachers, who work with us. And me, I, I know at that uh, leadership level, we appreciate having to um, engage in the PDSAs because it keeps us accountable and it, and it keeps us you know, curious um, and planning and, and taking an inquiry-based approach as leaders to problem solving and sometimes even anticipating things before they can occur at the building level. And then it lends itself to supporting teachers because this is what this is ultimately about and we really wanna impact learning. And um, we also work hand in hand with our instructional coaches. We're, we're extremely fortunate in Port Chester that we have literacy instructional coaches and also dual language instructional coaches and uh, who work with our teachers and they they're like the bridge they are the bridge that connects the arc coaches with the leadership with the the teachers and they just kind of all bring it all together right they're they're at the ground level they're hearing the day in and day out concerns of teachers the good the bad and the ugly they they hear it at the leadership level you know and they can bring it back and i just i i think that i don't know if every district has um instructional coaches but i think for us that has been a critical piece of the work that we're doing and getting our teachers on, on board and then moving through through the process. I like what you said that sometimes uh, you have a clear vision of where you're going, but you're not ready to take on everything. But in your situation, you put all the pieces together, but you're also providing a lot of supports. Does anybody want to add anything from the teacher perspective, the, the principal perspective or the district perspective in terms of challenges and successes in bringing the what, the how, and the data together? Well, I'll just uh, piggyback on one of the things you said about the teachers feeling overwhelmed. And we've heard a good bit about that. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard a good bit about that as well. I mean, ARC is a much more um, comprehensive program than a lot of new curriculums. And so it does have a lot of moving pieces. But what we have noticed in our classroom observations recently is that teachers aren't letting go of 
of other things. And so um, one of my colleagues in another district, used, they're about to um, use adopt a new curriculum and they were talking about decluttering. And they're really focusing before they do that on decluttering and that's letting go of the ineffective things or the old resources that we have been using um, because that, that that's what we're seeing. And so what we're seeing in the classroom is teachers are still trying to add all of these things in that don't need to be added in. And so that is, you know, overwhelming and causing a lot of extra stress unnecessarily. How do these things fit together? They don't <laughs> let them go. <laughs> so it's really important to stay the course, right? To monitor what is going on, because truly if you're trying to bring um, literacy, all the components together, reading, writing, oracy, uh, differentiation, you are gonna have to stick with it in order to declutter like you're saying. But Chrissy, let, let's stay with you a little bit more because um, you talk about like highlights of what you have learned, but also looking back what you have done, you would have done differently. Can you share a little bit from the district perspective, what did you learn in terms of your implementation? And then I'm also going to go to Shoshone. Go ahead. Absolutely. So we're in year two of our implementation. Um, we are implementing all the components K five. We are a small district, so um, Gail is tired. My, <laughs> my our district reading coach, Gail, uh, Dr. Hardwick, that's here with us. Um, we, you know, it is a it has been a huge lift. We have two district reading coaches. We have a small staff. We do have instructional coaches at every school, so we are very fortunate to have them on board. Um, we have seen a lot of successes over the last two years, and and most of the excesses successes um, fall within what you were mentioning earlier. Um, we are seeing an alignment of expectations, we're seeing common understandings, um, and we're seeing um, alignment of the curriculum. So that is huge for our students. I can also say that one of the most common pieces of positive feedback that I get from teachers is the um, diversity and the positive representation of students of color in the classroom libraries. Um, you know, I have teachers and students saying for the first time, I'm, I see myself reflected in the, the literature that we have. So that's been amazing. And that's a perfect alignment with our equity work that we're doing here. Yeah. That was also one of the reasons that we adopted um, ARC, it did score so highly on the culturally responsive scorecard that we use during our adoption. So, so again, those are some great successes. One of the things that we added this year was the leadership series, and that has been huge. Um, we have had so many ahas, and it has really brought things together. And so if I say, you know, I guess my aha from that is that I would have started there. Um, I would have really started with a lot more community engagement and leader engagement before we rolled it out for the teachers. Um, yeah, definitely build that understanding. Lesson. Good lesson, good lesson. What about, I, they, they, we had a couple more people that had like different perspectives in terms of getting started. Andrea, can you talk a little bit? And then also Jessica, talk a little bit about your experience in getting started, getting buy-in. Sure. This is Andrea from Shoshone. Um, I will say that I believe was one of the very best stepping stones in terms of our success with American Reading Company. Um, when we were reviewing curriculum and spending a lot of time digging in to determine what direction we were going next, um, we actually had 100%, if you will, buy-in from our staff. Um, that was tremendous in really coming together to understand exactly the direction we're going and really what we wanted for our, our school and our kids. In fact, we actually had our teachers present to our school board um, when the when push came to shove and it was time to actually adopt the curriculum and really commit to it. Um, quite a long partnership. Um, it was the teachers that were right there discussing it with our board. And um, from that point forward, it has just been everybody all in. Um, and that has made a tremendous difference. Um, I will say in terms of highlights, you know, one of the absolute highlights for us with American Reading Company has been how we're able to utilize um, the ARC toolkits in our MTSS framework. Um, in short, we have about 45 minutes every single day, Monday through Thursday, um, where every child in our kindergarten through sixth grade receive instruction um, at their level. And, and really not only just at their level, but really on the skills that they need on that day. Um, that is completely possible with the um, independent uh, reading level assessment, which is the ERLA um, that lives on the school pace uh, website, which is the data 
warehouse, if you will. So really on any given day, uh, we with student power goals, we can tell you by student what they are working on, where they are going, and really what they have to do to get there. Um, the intentionality and the individualized learning truly is unprecedented in our school. Um, it's resulted in incredibly meaningful learning and growth across the board. Um, just a couple other plugs, I would say, you know, as far as highlights have been the coaching, you know, the, really the individualized coaching that ARC has provided us. Um, we've been able to do it even by grade level. So the ARC coach will work directly with a grade level based on what their needs are. It's been um, tremendous, the support along the way. Again, we're in year five and we're still, still utilizing them um, in so many neat ways that really are meeting us where we're at. Um, and then finally, I would say, you know, a, a highlight for us is also engagement, student engagement, but as well as teacher engagement. Um, the teachers are having a blast. They they absolutely love teaching the units. They um, and they have a lot of autonomy in making choices about about the the teaching. Um, and kids are just generally engaged. So um, I would say those are the highlights. As far as hindsights, we just wish we would have found you sooner. So. <laughs> Thank you. Jessica, can you can you talk a little bit about your hindsights and your highlights? What did you learn? Where are you going next? So our hindsights and our highlights. So our highlights is we really focused last year, our superintendent, Dr. Sanchez, got groups together around American Reading Company and really led the, the initiative to look at our literacy programs. And we engaged teachers in visits. We had committees come together, teacher voice. We had a small pilot. We presented to the board. And there's and what we call a collective unity of effort. Um, our literacy instruction has become a whole learning process for our district. So when we think about the continuous improvement and science of improvement, we are all engaging in it at the same time, our leaders, our teachers, our community, our board. Um, and so that is a huge highlight, I think. When we, when we thought about launching, we trained and provided teachers with support in June for September. So really understanding and looking at the needs of the practitioners who are going to be in the classroom and saying, let's give them some time and space to read and digest if they want to before September, before materials start coming in. In hindsight, I would have, uh, I don't know if we could know this in hindsight, but we're a large district and then there's a lot of materials. So it's a plus, but it's a delta, right? Because how do you manage all these materials coming in all the time? And in hindsight, if we would have known, maybe we could have staggered the deliveries a little bit more. We did four, maybe we should could have split those four up. And also uh, our dual language program, right? We, we implemented ARC year one. We are halfway through year one, uh, pre-K through 11th grade, right? And so we have ARC core K through eighth grade and then 100 book challenge in our pre-K program and 100 book challenge in our high school. So it's really a collective effort to ensure that all of our students are having the literacy, the robust literacy instruction that they deserve. Um, and so our dual language, you know, we have the blocks and times and it looks different in each of our programs. So in hindsight, taking a real robust look at that in the in June when, with teachers and then really planning that out because now we're doing that work. Now we're like, we started, we have 120 minutes, but this is not working. You know, we don't have enough time. And so we're being, we're being uh, proactive and working with our teachers for next year, but we're reactive and we're going through those struggles for this year. Thank you. I hope you are seeing how all of these leaders looked at their own system, at their context to determine what was the best entry point, but they all shared this um, consensus building. They were very deliberate about consensus building. And I love the idea of a pilot before rolling out. I also love the idea of teachers presenting to the board. I never heard of that before. I think that's absolutely brilliant, right? But all of you are present, hands on deck, and keeping the course. So we have heard different visions, um, different realities, different ways to start, different lessons learned. But in terms of like, you started mentioning the support, the support you provide, the support that you get. In terms of your improvement strategies, like the importance of the partnership, the professional learning, the differentiation, 
Can you share with us a little bit from your district perspective, Dr. Hartwick, I'm gonna start with you. What, how was this, this rolled out, this ongoing support and how is this working? Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, that's a great question. And I've heard a lot from the other districts about kind of how we did this as well. One of the things that we loved about um, Art Core was that they had this job embedded professional learning that we were excited about. And what does that really look like? And what does that mean? So what I've noticed and what we've, what the, the professional learning that has really been the key to our success is um, the, the on-site job embedded coaching within each of our schools with our art coach. So our art coaches come and we have these on-site workshops where they work with us um, and collaborative planning meetings or even one-on-one -on -one with teachers. Um, we've had data meetings one-on-one -on -one with the art coach and for looking at school-paced data, um, webinars, like online format. I mean, Art Core is, is very, um, flexible, if you will. I mean, and, and meeting all of our needs in any way that we we need. The leadership learning series, like um, Dr. Beam said, was humongous. Like having the buy-in from the leaders at the top, um, that partnership, we even have a partnership with Amelia Larson, who's come to our district and helped our teachers look through, you know, what does it mean, the science of reading, looking at the, you know, the blue and the green and the yellow levels. How do we get our kids um, moving from one color level to another when teachers are really, really um, hyper focused on power words? And it kind of gave us, you know, the partnership and our communication between um, our district and schools and art core and just understanding what our needs are, that is the glue that's helped move us along. And I would say the differentiated piece is, um, is, is, is what it is. And then not only with that, our district initiative, like our district literacy initiative for the district are to have us to have this comprehensive ELA instruction that's grounded in the science of research. So what we've had to do as a district also is our district is making sure that all of our teachers, all of our K-5 teachers, along with any of our 612 intervention teachers have a science of reading, um, a required science of reading short course that we have to take. We offer Orton Gillingham, um, classes on learning the methodologies of, of OG, we offer that in our system. We have um, cohorts of letters, which is language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. Like these are the things that we, we provide and um, try to have ongoing support for the teachers to help build their toolbox of strategies to help work within um, the art curriculum so that everything that we do is, and our teachers are understanding the why the why behind, the, you know, the arc, because the arc is giving us the how, but do they know why? So we're doing the why part. And then the how is we're getting that PD from the art coaches and so that they can, um, they're skillful in giving a high quality curriculum to our students. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to hear from you, um, um, Emily, Emily, uh, in terms of your experience with this uh, support, this ongoing support, I hope you are hearing here that it's not enough to get the right what, um, the right how, the differentiated, the partnership, right? When you invest this much, your success has to be our success, right? So this is really critical, but can you talk to me a little bit about, about your experience? Sure. Hi, good evening, everybody. I'm Emily Macias Capellan, and I am one of the principals in Austining. My building is the pre-K and kindergarten building. And I would say off the bat, I, I think that for me, the credibility in our building really starts with the leadership and putting myself there in front of teachers as a learner alongside of them has been exponentially valuable because it means that our conversations are really honest and we go to where the challenges are. And so we are able to, first of all, celebrate everybody's successes because everybody is um, succe succeeding 
everybody has um, implemented the program. No one is saying I am not going to do it. Um, there's been exponential growth already that we see in our data. And also starting from a place of what teachers were easily able to translate into the new program. So for us, looking at, for me, looking at what was low hanging in fruit, for example, I'll look at uh, the morning message. So while we've adopted a new program, we haven't let go of all the wonderful things and good teaching practices that teachers already come with and have come with and are able to do very quickly. So using morning message as the high leverage time of the day to really apply for students the reading and writing together has been a game changer. And one of the things that I do is really celebrate that work. We share pictures of students' work in our social media, in our weekly memos with teachers, private conversations with them, grade level meetings to talk about all the wonderful things kids are doing. But in terms of really supporting, I, I want to I really want to emphasize the work that the coach has and the relationship that the coach has with the leadership in the building, how important that is. Because of the coach that we have, we are able to constantly look at challenges. We look at data together. We're able to apply and pivot and then adapt and then come back and assess how we're doing and, and we move from there. So that has been that has been a great, a great addition to not just the, the classroom instruction, but also from from the back end, how he is supporting our leadership team as well. Thank you. I'm, I'm so appreciative of you positioning yourself as a learning leader, right? Uh, and also the way you described how you support your teachers, I think we have what we want for our kids, we must want for our teachers, right? We have to move them from where they are. So affirming what they can already do, giving them a power goal to continue in the journey, right? Everything we want for our kids, we must want for our teachers. I do want to hear um, to finalize, and then I'm going to ask you to please, this is going so fast, I'm going to ask you to please think about something that you didn't say that you really wanted to say, and we're going to do a, a quick round. But um, Heidi in Afton, you have been with us for five years. And I, I want you to talk about the journey of the support, because when I see you now, after five years, there are many things that I don't need you to support in. So talk about this journey of that you gained all the expertise to take over certain things and partner with us for other things. Well, first of all, we really appreciate the partnership and we um, just we enjoy this to me and the, the learning, the ongoing learning that has happened. Um, when we started five years ago, somebody made mention to us to just give yourselves grace your teacher's grace, your kid's grace, yourself's grace as you're leading and growing. And we have really stuck with that and stuck with being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And so this process over the last handful of years with that attitude, um, partnering with the coaches and learning and growing, what we have learned is that our team together, working through our PLCs and our teachers supporting each other, we're just very transparent in our struggles and our growths and our celebrations um, as teachers, what we're doing well, what we really need support with. Um, and again, what we ask for coaching, what we can ask from for each other. Um, some teachers have really shown um, their strengths and supported each other. So that's very cool. But we also are very transparent in sharing our students. So we share data and what our students need and support. So that ongoing growth of our staff and coaching and in just that adaptability, we've grown as a staff in, in just that um, ability to dig deep and be transparent in where we need to grow. Alicia told us how important it is to understand the complexity of the system, to align our efforts, and then to have discipline to truly improve over time learn by improving. Then we heard from our partners how having clarity around what they're trying to do, where they are, their reality versus their vision, but also having the right choices, the right what, the right how, and sticking with it, being there, being present every day, 
and being patient. I love what you said. Give ourselves grace, right? Um, we also heard that sometimes we need to insert additional things. And when we do that, how do we maintain integrity? We heard so much from so many of you. There's so much more to talk about. I have to have you back, like one district at a time. But I want to start with you. What is something that you did not hear? Um, after, what is something that you did not hear that you want to really leave with people? Oh my goodness. Well, I, I was actually just looking at kind of the notes that we'd outlined and it's just so great that most of our talking points honestly have already come up. Um, I think probably for me is just the collective efficacy that we have in our school and we believe in each other. We learn from each other. We are transparent with our data. We live in real time. And honestly, it's just our motto by how we live every day. Um, we are the village and we fight for our village. And we do whatever it takes to make sure that every parent, every family, every teacher is on board. And we just spend lots of time and energy be behind the, that work and those efforts because we just know it works and we believe in it. So, no. So, again, yeah, I just echo everything else that I've honestly heard today. And, again, we, we believe it. And I think that we're excited to share about it. So, thank you. Jessica, what's something you didn't say that you want to leave with people? What I want to leave with people is, you know, you could, um, ARC is different, right? It's not just a resource. And I think you don't understand that until you embark in the process and the science of improvement in partnership with ARC. So the leadership series, our leaders come in and help our our leaders grow and understand the science of improvement, the coaches for the teachers. Really, it's a partnership not just buying a resource. And I think that that is key with the outcomes that we're seeing and why all the districts have stayed in partnership with you. Thank you. Thank you. Christy. Um, I, I agree. I, I mean, so much has been, this has been such an informative hour and a half, but it's our hour. It's been wonderful. Um, I would just say, you know, stay the course, trust the process, really dig in, make sure that your leaders, your community, um, everyone understands the vision and and what we're trying to do so that everybody's behind it and, and ready to go. Communicate, right? Seven times, seven ways. Yes. Alicia, what about you? What do you want to say? Honestly, if I'm if I'm being honest, I'm just sitting here like, why why can't I teach in your school? <laughs> Can I come back? I'm like ready to go on. I just am like very inspired by the way you guys talk about the vision for your kids. That the that part was very inspiring to me. And at the same time, are willing to face into what's not working. Um, and this acknowledgement of how it takes us all working together and that you're everybody's a learner all the way across the organization, I just think is um you know, it's really rare. So, I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, you know, sometimes when you, when I hear you guys talk about it, it seems like, well, how else would it be? But I, I think it's rare in the country. So I think um, it's just exciting to see, um, see that approach. And it seems like an amazing place, places to work that I would love to work in. And I can't wait to see um, where you go. What we want for our kids, we must want for our teachers. Yeah. Gail, what do you want to say that you haven't said? Um, I would say the most exciting thing as a district person going into all the schools is the common language that we all speak and art gives that to us. And it feels really good that we're all speaking the same language. We all want the same things. We're looking at the same type of data and just the shared understanding and it, it feels good. So ARC is great. Thank you. Judy. So one of the things that you said, Amelia, that I liked was this idea of power goals for teachers, and I'm going to add for leaders, um, based, and I'm thinking, wow, this would be great, like based on where we are in our continuum of learning, um, to have power goals that are data-driven and inquiry-based. I think that's something that, you know, is worth exploring. I'm doing that with exercise. I haven't mm -hmm. found a way yet. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Carroll. Uh, I think it, that it's um, there's plenty of opportunity to include parents and community in this work. And when we started out, we began with parent surveys and parent focus groups to really get parents engaged in the process of looking at our literacy process and um, getting their feedback about what they wanted to see with their for their children. And we've done lots of presentations to the board and the community. And now we're running parent universities 
um, and really being honest about the process and where we are and what their students are doing and how we're learning along with the teachers and students. And there's tools within ARC to communicate with parents that are really great resources to have. So really keeping parents close. Um, as Alicia mentioned that Brian Stevenson quote, quote about the people that are close have to be in the weeds, I'm paraphrasing here, but to get to, to make change. And I think really including parents in the mix is important. Oh, I love that. We're gonna come back for more conversation around that. Emilia? I would say, um, and it's been said before, but I'll uh, repeat it. Trust the process of learning and just feel that this productive struggle, because it's not meant to be easy, is good. It's actually a, a sign of change, right? So that's what I would add. I always say the same thing, Emily. If it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. <laughs> Andrea. Thank you. Um, I guess I would chime in and, and first of all, just really want to uh, give a huge kudos to our team here in Shoshone. We certainly have done some phenomenal work over the past five years, and it, it would not have been possible um, without the tremendous team of people behind it every day. So a huge shout out to our, our team here. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, in terms of ARC, um, you know, they are constantly um, updating resources and in response to research and response to feedback from the field. I will tell you, we have had a lot of feedback that we've shared towards ARC, and they are just so responsive. Um, and, and that has made a tremendous difference. And especially, um, you know, just staying abreast in what's currently happening in the, in, in the world of, of reading and science of reading and whatnot, they have been incredibly responsive and things are updated even on the online resource centers um, in, in very short order. And so that has also been a tremendous gift for us um, as we move through the process. So, um, you know, again, that science of improvement mark is at the forefront all the time. So thank you. Thank you. Heidi, you're the last one. Um, <laughs> I just thinking about um, why we're all here and it is for student learning. And I think being in the classroom and leading teachers, the most impressive thing that I've seen in this process is the change in students. The students have taken ownership of their learning, their reading, their love of reading. I teach um, our smallest little preschoolers. And when I have three-year-olds that can pick out their favorite books and tell you why, and no, and the older kids, and struggling readers who know what their next goal is and their next thing to achieve. So yes, improvement is so important for us as adults, but also for those kiddos to know how to improve and grow and really dig into that love of reading is just the reason we're all here. So um, what a gift to see that. <laughs> I am, I'm going to finish with a story because I, I visited uh, Shoshone. I visited the classroom, the kindergarten classroom. It was at the end of the year. And there was this, all these kindergarten kids working. They knew what they were doing. Agency finalizing like these big sentences, but there was a brand new girl. And you could see the difference between um, the agency piece. And, but what I saw was a young student in kindergarten, helping this young girl. And she wrote a sentence and she wrote R, the word R, and it was A capital R E. And the, the little girl from Shoshone that had been there for a long time said, yeah, this is not at the beginning of the sentence. It really should be lowercase. And she goes like, this is R. Uh, she, the other little girl responded, this is an R. This is how I know how to do it. She goes, she goes it's okay, I'll teach you down up and around let's do it with me and i'm going like what so um it, it's just typical they know what to do it's theirs they take ownership they see it they hear it they use it and they write about it that is what we want i want to thank you so much for sharing your journey just a little piece but enough for me to know i need to have you back so next um our next webinar there has been a lot of talk about assessment um, in universal screeners and what is the impact on multilingual learners. So join us in March to hear from this incredible, incredible panel around best practices for assessment and decision making for all students, including multilingual learners. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.